हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, Hare Krishna everyone. Uh, we would like to start off uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, the topic is very interesting. It's called Feel Good, Feel Bad Spirituality. Uh, just to kick off, um, I did a survey this week. Um, I questioned 18 devotees how they feel overall. Um, so out of these 18 devotees, 12 were practicing Krishna consciousness for several years. Um, and the remaining six were new. And interestingly, the 12 devotees who were practicing Krishna consciousness for a, a, a longer period of time, they were actually feeling bad most of the times. And the people who were starting Krishna consciousness, they were actually feeling good most of the times. And it was very interesting to me. And when I asked uh, a little bit more on why they were feeling bad, the 12 devotees, they mentioned that they're feeling bad because their quality of chanting is not good. They're feeling bad because they're not reading enough of Srila Prabhupada's books. They're feeling bad because they're not able to hear as much as they would like. They're feeling bad because they're not, not able to remember Krishna as much as they would like. So this was interesting. So they have more feeling bad moments than feeling good moments. So this uh, is uh, like an introduction to this topic of today. So Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, if you could please tell us, is it okay to feel bad most of the time as practicing devotees? Uh, or do we always have to feel good? Because spirituality is meant for making us feel good overall. So any thoughts on this, uh, on this particular topic? Yeah. It's quite revealing that so many devotees uh, felt this way. Thank you for doing the survey. Also, so firstly, we are our only resource in our spiritual journey. We are not, not necessarily only Krishna is a resource, devotees are the resource, the scriptures are the resource, but we are the only resource in the sense that unless we ourselves are willing and enthusiastic, none of the other resources can actually benefit as much. As they say, God helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. Actually, I try to put it there. I feel that saying is not that precise because God helps even those who don't help themselves. But the more precise wording could be that even God can't help those who don't help themselves. So the opposite more is more precisely true. That now is God not all powerful? He is. But... Uh, a, we see like example, even Krishna went to Shanti Dut, but he couldn't help Duryodhan. Duryodhan was not ready to take the help. So I would say the converse is more true. And so if feeling bad is making us discouraged, de-energized, making us feel hopeless, then that feeling will be unhealthy. Because then we will not be able to take that much enthusiastic or determined shelter of Krishna. But if feeling bad is in the context of feeling overall confident that I can improve and that it inspires us to take more shelter of Krishna, then it could be healthy. It could be energized. It could be actually, uh, it could be the necessary spur we need for uh, becoming, for going deeper, and becoming stronger in our spiritual lives. So one aspect of uh, surrender is acceptance. Another aspect of surrender, is, or we could even say love, if surrender sounds like a too big a word. One aspect of sur surrender is acceptance. The other is aspiration. So when we talk about, I'm surrendered to you. Especially not in a, in a loving sense. That means I'm ready to do whatever you want. So that is true. But another aspect is acceptance. You know, okay, this is how I am. And this is, this is how I, it may be because of my karma or whatever else. But ultimately, it's within Krishna's arrangement. So I accept myself as I am. So, if there is, uh, so whatever situation I am put in, whether it is because of my past karma, whether it is because of somebody else's actions, whatever reason it is, I accept. So feeling bad, if it is leading to say, resentment towards our family, our job, 
our health situation, whatever we feel is distracting us from Krishna. If it is create leading to that kind of resentment and negative feeling, then definitely that's not healthy from a devotional perspective. But if resentment, if that uh, feeling bad is trying to make us more, is making us not resentful, but resourceful that, okay, you know, okay, here there is some little time. Let me adopt this properly or here. Let me use this better. So if it's making us more resourceful in spiritualizing our consciousness, then that is healthy. So in principle, I would say it's falena parichayate. We'll have to look at the fruit that certainly we shouldn't be feeling so bad about ourselves that we end up, uh, we end up discouraged. And uh, from another more philosophical perspective, we could say that, as I said, one point is we are our only resource. And another perspective for this could be that it is for us to know that emotions are also like energies. And we don't want our emotional energy to work against us or to leave us uh, leave us uh, powerless. So if, if I'm feeling too bad about something, then just like we can talk about physical austerities. Say if I fast, I feel a little discomfort. Now that discomfort can serve a purpose. But if the discomfort becomes so much that I can't, uh, I can't think about Krishna, I can't hear anything, then okay, I have to do something to manage the discomfort. Maybe take some food and then refocus on Krishna. So what applies to say physical discomfort, we can apply it to emotional discomfort also. That some amount of emotional discomfort for some higher purpose is helpful. But just as we might feel that, okay, I'm not doing this service so much. I'm not doing that service so much. I might feel like maybe I sleep too much. I would like to sleep less or maybe I spend too much time on this. I would like to spend time less. But we can't artificially reduce that. So we'll have to see what works for us. Just as we do that for the body, we can also do that for the mind. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prabhu. Uh, I just wanted to mention one more thing about the survey. Um, this is regarding the six uh, practitioners who just started Krishna consciousness more recently. And as I said, they actually felt good most of the time. They felt good that they, after chanting one round, they felt good after listening to a kirtan, they felt good for the exact same things that the devotees who are feeling bad, these new devotees are actually feeling good. Any comment on that? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, there's a god brother of mine. He says that when people come new to Krishna consciousness, we, we, offer them fried pakodas and when they become devotees we fry them like pakodas <laughs> so am i audible yes bro yes. yeah okay so basically sometimes uh, when people are new we don't really have much expectations from them and we don't pile them with we don't burden them with our expectations so in one sense whatever they do that's, that's one so wonderful. So we encourage them, we appreciate them. But once somebody becomes a devotee, then we have a whole, we could say almost like a truckload of expectations from them. And then instead of appreciating what they are doing, often we feel that you, they are not meeting expectations. So the focus shifts substantially. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, no. In a sense, as a person grows, just like a small child, a small infant takes the first step and, uh, and then just walks a few steps and slips and falls, the parents clap and appreciate. But then if there's a teenager boy who's carrying something for the parents or a young, young youth who's carrying something for the parents and they slip and fall and make a mess, well, they are not going to appreciate that. So in that sense, the difference is understandable. Uh, that naturally expectations grow as we grow, but overall the balance should be that uh, balance needs to be that devotees, especially because we are practicing, everybody is practicing bhakti voluntarily, that that the expectations should not outweigh the appreciations. 
we need to make sure that the devotees feel appreciated and valued for what they are doing and yes of course expectations are there but sometimes for devotees the expectations come out more and the appreciation doesn't come out that much okay thank you prabhu thank you uh, anyone else would like to go next ah uh, yes prabhu i'd like to start off uh, if that's okay so yeah uh, chaitanya chand prabhu so i had this question krishna tells that i mean we all know that krishna's love is unconditional he loves us no matter what right but at the same time we know that uh, uh, we have heard that we need to get purified like there is this verse as well in bhagavad gita 7.28 right yesham uh, tvantagatam papam so only when all the sins are eradicated and we so i take it as when we become purified that's when we can uh, practice bhakti right so how isn't it a an apparent contradiction like he uh, expects us to become purified but at the same time his love is unconditional so okay yeah. mm hmm i would say that there is uh, when krishna is talking about that particular verse say where he is talking about yesham tu antagatam papam there is one very significant caveat over there bhajante mam drudha vrataha so he is saying that then one can practice devotion with great determination or with great consistency so yes till we are purified the impurities will distract us and that's why our devotion may not be consistent so we try to focus on krishna we focus for some time and then we get attracted by this and that and then we don't focus on krishna and then after some time we resume our focus so that's what it means that at one level krishna makes himself accessible to us at whatever level we are at so even a person who is a drunk on a street can join the devotees and chant hari krishna and not only chant but can also experience some spiritual ecstasy something which makes them feel makes uplifted and enlivened so in that sense krishna makes himself available always to everyone however we could say that impurities prevent us as from being available for krishna or not so much prevent obstruct they make it more difficult they don't make it always impossible but they definitely make it more difficult so so krishna makes himself accessible available for us but we also need to be available to him but when the impurities are present then krishna is there we can turn toward him but we are we are we get turned toward other things so in that sense uh, krishna's love for us is unconditional because he always makes himself accessible to us it's also conditional because every relationship has to be reciprocal and you know, love can be one one way or as is sometimes it's called one sided love many times that can be that's a theme of movies and other things love can be one sided but a loving relationship has to be reciprocal it can't be one way so in that sense for us sometimes we may not be able to connect with krishna and that's why it is sometimes said that krishna's i never heard the word conditional or unconditional specifically used in a spiritual sense in 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 sanskrit but the idea that we we can we are always loved by krishna but we won't always feel loved by krishna because presently our feelings are are influenced a lot by our mind and its conditionings our mind our ego all those things so so the more we become purified the more we start experiencing krishna's love okay yes prabhu yeah i mean i just thought of something so this is very much synonymous to uh, the holy name we say that the holy name is the sweetest nectar that you can experience but then on a conditioned stage we do not experience it uh, yes. so it's not that the holy name is not sweet it's that our our ability to perceive the sweetness of the holy name has been uh, diminished because of the impurities or uh, whatever yes correct correct perfect very good example yeah 
Uh, yeah, thank you, bro. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Shri Tanisha Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Um, <laughs> kind of going back to what Gaur Kumar started out with this evening um, about kind of experiencing, um, you know, we, we expect ourselves to experience pleasure in, in, in Krishna consciousness, but we don't always. And I was thinking of um, Bhagavad Gita chapter 9, text 2, where Krishna says that, um, that devotional service should be joyfully performed, but again, as we know, it's not always so um, easy to perform things. Like sometimes our minds wander when we're chanting and we, it's hard to stay focused, or sometimes, you know, devotees experience other um, difficulties in their devotional service. So how, can you just explain how we are to understand that? Okay, so how is devotional service joyful or joyfully performed when we all experience, even senior devotees experience difficulties? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough to really make sense of this, but two, three things I would like to say that uh, Krishna, you know, when he is describing characteristics, say for example, 9-2, that verse, that um, that is Raja Vidya Raja Guhyam Pavitram Idamuttam Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmyam Susukham Kartam Avyayam So that Susukham is joyful. So now there is a difference between the process of Bhakti and our experience of the process of Bhakti. So, for example, there is a well-known verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Ahaituki Apratihata Yatma Suprasidati, where in the 126 it is said that devotional service should be unmotivated, uninterrupted, and it fulfills the heart. So now normally say Prabhupada translates it as we should perform devotional service that is unmotivated and uninterrupted. And there are other times when Vishwan Chakadakur, for example, applies that not as a describer of the devotee's performance of bhakti, as of as a but as a characteristic of devotional service itself. So he says, devotional service is not interrupted by anything material, and devotional service is not motivated by anything material. So when he's talking about this. He's talking about he, that there, there is sometimes something which is descriptive and something which is prescriptive. So descriptive means he's saying this is how devotional service is. Now what is he talking about there? He's talking about pure devotional service. And pure devotional service, this is how it is. Now will it be the same way for us? Yes, when we become purified. Till that time there will be challenges. So then the same statements that are descriptive for pure devotees are, can be seen as prescriptive for practicing devotees. That this is how pure devotees naturally feel, but this is how practicing devotees should try to feel. Say for example, so unmotivated and uninterrupted, then as devotees who are practicing sadhakas, we try to make sure that our practice is unmotivated and uninterrupted. We try to be as consistent and as pure-hearted as possible in our at least our aspirations. So same way with susukham kartum avyayam, susukham is, is descriptive for the pure devotees. That for those who are very pure, those who are very advanced and purified, they will naturally connect with Krishna. And even if they are having worldly difficulties uh, because of just being situated in the world, but their consciousness will transcend to those worldly difficulties because they will be so deeply connected with Krishna. That yam labdhva cha param labham manyate na dhikam tata yasmin stona dukhe na guruna api In 622 Krishna says that those who become situated in transcendence, they are not disturbed by even, even by great disturbances, great distresses. That's because they experience the connection with Krishna with the connection uh, as so intimate and so fulfilling. So this is descriptive of pure devotees. 
and it is prescriptive for us prescriptive means that when we are practicing bhakti we try to be as cheerful as possible so one way to understand is when prabhupad would say chant hari krishna and be happy these are not this is not just one causal instruction it is two parallel instructions it is not always that chanting hari krishna will make us happy sometimes we chant hari krishna and cultivate happiness or joy as a conscious choice so what does it mean be happy that means in every situation in our life there are things which are right and there are things which are wrong and if you look at the things that are right we will feel satisfied we will feel grateful if you look at the things that are wrong we will feel unhappy we will feel resentful so manah prasad samyatvam maunam atma vinigraha so one of the austerities of the mind which krishna talks about in 1716 is manah prasad is cultivating a cheerful disposition so he's not saying that just you will automatically be cheerful but cultivate the disposition so devotees look at look at the positives in their life and ultimately for a devotee the most positive reality is krishna so devotees are looking for krishna and by seeing krishna's hand even in their difficulties or remembering krishna independent of whatever difficulty they are going through then we can actually find something to be happy about even i mean in distressing situations so yes it may not we won't be we may not be naturally happy either because of our practical situations or even because of our practices of bhakti but if by consciously looking at the positives we can cultivate cheerfulness then that will help us connect better with krishna so this 9 2 we can connect later with 10 10 when krishna says that we need to perform bhakti priti purvak and then we will connect deeper with him tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayanti te that when we are affectionate when we are grateful when we are cheerful then we can connect with him nicely and then we can then he will guide you as guidance from within how to choose wisely and come closer to him so in that sense so sukham we can see that as a as a prescription as as prescriptive for our present practices so the answer question thank you thank you so yes it does can i ask just one follow up question i'm sorry yes please, please. <laughs> i don't i don't want you to get into the whole nine um stages of um of devotional service but when so i've i've heard that most of us in the material world are in the anartana vritti stage mm-hmm. and so it's kind of hard to understand when we actually trans or yeah when we actually get to um we go from the uh prescriptive to the descriptive when we are in that anartha and avritti stage how how is that possible for us yeah when do we go beyond anartha and avritti that's difficult to say basically two things are there one is if we just keep practicing bhakti we are growing and as we keep growing the anarthas keep going down and we start rising upward in our consciousness so of the example sometimes is given is like it's like the rising of the sun say early in the morning if we go out for a japa walk or something like that it might be early morning it might be dawn it might be uh we feel that it's dark and then we are chanting and then at one time we suddenly notice hey it's light it's it's daytime so the sun was rising constantly but our awareness or our realization that the sun has risen it came at a particular point so like that if we keeping if we keep practicing bhakti we will be growing spiritually and at one particular time we will realize that oh yes the krishna sun has risen in my heart so yes now the same arthas which were earlier troubling me so much don't trouble me that much uh, they they don't even trouble me at all so that's that's one aspect to realize we, from our consistent practice the the progress is happening and we will realize at one time that the progress is happening progress has happened rather another point would be that uh, it is uh, there's a thin balance between being introspective and being calculative that we want to be introspective to make sure that we are going in the right direction but sometimes 
when we talk about these stages of bhakti and uh, okay i'm at this stage and i want to go at this stage so it can make us too calculative we can become calculative in comparing with others and then in general some uh, the inner world and the inner journey it's all subtle so in some ways at least this is my understanding that uh, these are not necessarily discrete linear stages that it's only after anartha nivritti ends that nishtha begins if you consider that way sadhu sangha and bhajana kriya they are something which we are going to we are going to do always isn't it so the stage of sadhu sangha never ends the stage of bhajana kriya never ends so rather than worry too much about whether i have gone beyond a particular stage or not we can focus more on whether i am connecting with the next stage or not that means look at whether okay is my faith becoming stronger is it becoming even if sometimes i hear criticism counter arguments i might not be able to answer those arguments but is my inner conviction strong still so that that is an indicator i am going to anishtha or we might even have ruchi for certain things yeah this is really i i understand this i like uh, i am i have a taste for this so rather than worrying about whether we have transcended a particular stage or not we can focus or we can focus on whether we are connecting with the next stage or not and that way we can be moving onwards progressively and because sometimes depending on particular conditioning some arthas may be very deep rooted and they may take a long time to go so rather than defining our spiritual success based on the uh, cessation of certain arthas we can define it more in terms of connection with the higher stages of devotion okay thank you that's a good question hari krishna shri tanya charan prabhu hari krishna krishna thank you uh, i had a i had a question um if we are to rise beyond the feel good feel bad bhakti do we have to also reject some aspect of bhakti that we like because for example it makes me feel good um for me personally i love philosophy i love hearing from great souls like yourself and i could read and hear all day um which of course in turn in turn will in turn intensify my faith in krishna consciousness but is that a material good feeling that might just be gratifying for example my intellect which is material um how do we know something we are doing is actually spiritual bliss versus material bliss thank you yeah so there is if if we are doing something we like to doing it then is it it's connected with bhakti but is it material or is it spiritual there could be different ways of looking at this and i'll focus on it more from a varanashram perspective not necessarily varanashram in the sense of dividing society into classes but more in terms of recognizing that everybody was expected to act according to their nature for krishna so broadly we could say that the those who are brahmanas their primary connection and contribution is in the field of ideas the connection of the kshatriyas is more in the field of activities or not just activities but say managing overseeing governance you could say administration governance the primary contribution of vaishyas is more in terms of resources generating resources managing resources allotting resources like that and the contribution of vaishudras is more in terms of functionality that making sure that things keep working that this thing works that thing works functionality so now often we think of these four as hierarchical but from a social con- so- social sustenance perspective all four are required so we could say all four are parallel all four are needed so each of us the what the what the bhagavad gita says stresses is that we all have a natural psychological orientation psychophysical orientation and we need to serve krishna with that orientation so it tells krishna tells arjuna that you are a kshatriya you can't serve like a brahmana mm-hmm. so arjuna wants to forgive the kauravas 
and forgiveness is so valid and valuable as a as a individual prerogative but forgiveness cannot be a administrative policy and the police cannot forgive everyone it cannot be the default administrative policy otherwise there will be no justice in society so krishna is telling arjuna you cannot act like a brahmana right now you are you are a head of the state you are you are you are a part of the royal family so you need to act like a kshatriya so the point is that we all have a psychological psychophysical orientation and we need to serve accordingly so in that sense it's a it's not that we have to reject that at all in fact we will be able, uh, much of the much of in my understanding much of the dissatisfaction that devotees feel when they are practicing spiritual life and they often diagnose it as a spiritual dissatisfaction but it is actually a material dissatisfaction that means not material dissatisfaction in the sense that i don't it's not that i i don't have a big enough house i don't earn so much i don't have that good relationships but material dissatisfaction means that the devotee is not materially compatibly engaged and because of that the stress in practicing bhakti is so great or the stress of just living in a state of inner conflict is so great and even when they try to practice bhakti they can't connect with krishna they can't experience taste in the practice of krishna bhakti so sometimes as a matter of surrender if we are required to do a particular particular service we we do that over a period of time however as we understand ourselves better as we evolve in bhakti then we need to find our space and serve krishna within that space so if you like philosophy then wonderful just use that and uh, uh, use that to connect with krishna and then use see how you can use that to contribute you can share it with others so you can share it by speaking you can share it by blogging you can share it in so many ways so uh, there is no need to it, it's almost paradoxical so what we as if i may rephrase what you are saying is should we feel bad about feeling good in bhakti <laughs> <laughs> no of course we don't need to feel bad about feeling good so what would be a problem is that we make feeling good the primary parameter and not bhakti the primary parameter say i like to read so then yes i read books connected with krishna now if just because of i like to read i start reading any book any book and every book that anyone is writing then maybe if that's not connected with krishna that's not connected with philosophy and that's not connected with say helping me share krishna's message with others then maybe that's that's not i am letting my nature see we have a material nature and we have a spiritual nature the spiritual nature is that i serve krishna the material nature is that i harmonize with my body so i harmonize with my body mind's orientation or dispositions so then our material nature and spiritual nature need to go together so if i follow my material nature to such an extent that it takes away from takes me away from my spiritual nature that's unhealthy but if in trying to act according to the spiritual nature i start suppressing my material nature that's also unhealthy so we need a balance of both okay. okay thank you so much that was wonderful thank you so much thank you hari krishna It's a very important question. Any other questions? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I'd like to ask one question. So yes, we are always told, like uh, we also spoke about anartha nivritti, and uh, I think even Acharya say that anartha nivritti is the longest stage, right? In the in the in the within the nine stages, because it might take even lifetimes to get purified. So we are yeah. there is this whole focus on getting purified, you know. and when there is this whole focus on getting purified it kind of makes us feel that okay i am not at a level where i should be but because i am not purified enough and i have to get there but on the on the contrary we see many of these self help uh, preachers you know they they make they their whole uh, focus is to make us feel good about ourselves oh you know you are good you can do it you know you have the potential and things of that nature so uh shouldn't there be uh, you know both extremes are harmful we know that and shouldn't there be a balance between the two 
so uh, like even sri prabhupad for example he chastised his disciples at times but he also complimented them you know so as yeah. as far as outreach is concerned so how do we where do we draw the line exactly yeah, it's very important that uh, when we talk about self help as affirmations yes that you are um that you you have talent you have ability or whatever that kind of affirmations might be and uh, in bhakti we have a lot of expectations about getting purified so overall i would say that my understanding and it also may evolve in future it has evolved from the past right now what i focus in my uh, in my talks and my writings is not so much as getting purified as staying connected so if we stay connected we will get purified but if our focus is on getting purified then we are always in the two calculated stage am i getting purified or not if i'm not getting purified then what's wrong then why is that person getting more purified than me and then i i thought i was purified what happened did i go back now so we get a, we get too calculative too mental and too discontented when we focus too much on getting purified so instead of focusing on getting purified focus on staying connected if we stay connected with krishna purification will naturally come as a result because that's how it works krishna is all pure and staying connected with krishna will naturally purify us so i think that uh, that focus is healthier staying connected rather than getting purified certainly we want to get purified no doubt but that need not be our focus our focus on stay connected mm-hmm. and the other point would be that with respect to affirmations yes it's important for each one of us to to have an overall positive disposition toward ourselves see we are meant to love krishna and we are meant to love also all living beings as parts of krishna now among all the parts of krishna the part over which we have the most control the part for whom we are most responsible is we ourselves so how can i love krishna if i don't love the part of krishna that is closest to me that is i myself so we need to see loving ourselves as integral to loving krishna and we don't want to love ourselves in a narcissistic sense where we love ourselves and forget krishna but having a positive attitude toward ourselves is also a part of bhakti so we could say that prabhupad at one level if let's consider prabhupad's uh, markine bhagavad dharma song uh, where he at one level says that uh, i am so fallen i am insignificant and uh, he he says that uh, he expresses un, his lack of qualifications but at another level he also expresses his confidence that krishna will give mercy he expresses confidence that krishna has some purpose so although we could say prabhupad was humble but that did not mean that he didn't feel confident that he could do the service so there are two distinct aspects in this case that means humility is that we could say humility means i i am a servant but confidence means i can do this service so if i feel i am a servant and i can't do any service because i am so fallen so humility so in in a in another sense we could say humility means not that we, when we want to cultivate humility that doesn't mean i am fallen that need not be our focus but that i am a servant i am not the master i am not the boss i am not the lord i am a servant but then there is confidence required that yes i can not that i can do every service that i am told to do but i can do some service at least i can do something worthwhile in my service to krishna so even with respect to affirmations like everything in self help it is a double edged sword sword so people have found some there have been some studies done about affirmations and some people claim miracle cures that say uh, somebody has cancer and then they cultivate affirmations and then then their disease goes away there are some people who claim like that 
and sometimes it may be true also it's not just affirmations but it's a whole if the body mind's positive energy is also released that can aid the healing process but what has also been found is if the affirmations are are asserting or affirming some things that we know intuitively are true but we tend to forget them then those affirmations are hel helpful so for example when things are going wrong you know everything will be all right krishna is in control all is well so something like that this is a truth that we know but we tend to forget it so that kind of affirmation is is helpful but if the affirmation is about something that is that is not factually true and we also know at one level suppose somebody is short and they they are from i am tall i am tall i am tall well that is only going to cause psychological damage to them because they they are affirming something which is not true so whatever it is so in that sense affirmations are healthiest uh, they, they they have a healthy effect when they are about when we are affirming intuitive truths that we tend to forget so for example uh, if somebody starts uh, making affirmation i'm a pure devotee i'm a pure devotee well that would be artificial because okay some of you may be pure devotees but at least i'm not a pure devotee so, so but the point is that okay but if i affirm i'm a part of krishna 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 loves me that and krishna i can serve krishna something like that or you know i, I have conditionings but you know, i can still serve krishna in spite of my conditions so we can see what affirmations we want to make but if the affirmations are about truths that uh, are we know are intuitively true in, in the case of our intuition our intuition is guided by scripture also what scripture is also saying it is true then that those affirmations can actually help us ward off negativities so even in the practice of bhakti negativity can be unhealthy if it if it dampens our enthusiasm and de-energizes us so we could say that the need for purification if it's like focusing on purification purification that's one extreme of the pendulum focusing on affirmation is one extreme of the pendulum we could say the focus the balance state would be not purification not affirmation but connection stay connected with krishna and for connecting sometimes i need to have, remind myself that i have to become purified i'm not it pure sometimes i need to affirm that as i am krishna accepts me so i think i mentioned this in an earlier class that so krishna loves us as we are and he loves us too much to let us stay as we are he wants us to rise higher so sometimes we affirm that krishna loves me that's the affirmation part but sometimes we affirm, yes but krishna wants me to rise higher that's the purification part okay thank you Thank you very much, Prabhu Ji. That was really nice. Hare Krishna. Chaitanya Prabhu, I do have another question, if that is all right. Yes. So this ties back to what Guru Kumar Prabhu said in the very beginning. Um, that, uh, for example, uh, of the eighteen devotees that were surveyed, twelve that have been practicing long time uh, tend to feel bad, and. Um, for me personally, as I continue to walk the path of bhakti, we get more knowledge, um, but then the standards are also pushed higher, as you had mentioned. Um, one aspect is that we know what the idea standard is. For example, we should get in taste when we chant, why am I not feeling that? So we feel bad about ourselves. Um, another ideal standard in one sense, uh, so sometimes when we feel bad, I think it's because we get that, we are told what, not what we should, what we should be in that ideal standard. Um, and one thing that I've always had a question about is the two main rules that I, in one sense, our whole philosophy um, triangulates around is that we should always remember Krishna and never forget him at all times. Um, and my question is, from a practical standpoint, though, how should we actually understand this and carry it out? For example, uh, if those are those who have jobs in the outside world, they must engage with uh for example co-workers who are not devotees or krishna conscious and they are asking how they are or even performing their duties maybe for example coding that is not krishna kata or speaking philosophy but it is a complete subject matter that is separate from krishna consciousness 
that in bhakti there are certain expectations and sometimes we feel bad because we're not able to meet the standards say for example we told to always remember krishna but in our social dealings or in our professional activities we may not always remember krishna so how do we try to apply the standard is that the question broadly yes it is okay. thank you and, and perhaps it's my misunderstanding of that uh role um that i'm feeling badly if you can help me understand and even from what we had just mentioned our outer world dealings etc even asking how people are it's not directly related no. to krishna so how do we not feel bad about ourselves or how can we do so by actually understanding this role thank you yes i have thought a lot about this and i have tried to read and uh, discuss with devotees also so in some ways i feel that the bhagavad gita is a book that is a part of the mahabharat and how the bhagavad gita is to be applied that is demonstrated in the mahabharat not entirely because the mahabharat is not necessarily talking about pure devotional service but it is demonstrated at some level so when we see after the bhagavad gita's battle arjuna is fighting a war so when arjuna is fighting a war he is in dead earnest about the war it is not that he is looking at the war as hare krishna hare krishna 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 he is not chanting the names of krishna he might be chanting inside the mind but he is completely focused on fighting the war and so the idea is that when we are doing a particular service for krishna then we do it wholeheartedly and sometimes it happens that some devotees they were talking with them and they are chanting at the same time and they say i want to constantly chant krishna's names but then you start feeling annoyed i'm talking with you so i'm hearing but i'm chanting also uh so now that's not the warmest kind of interaction we can have with someone because they seem to be preoccupied with other things so if we understand the bhakti or remembrance of krishna it's not an activity it's a relationship that's critical we sometimes reduce bhakti to activities bhakti means chanting hare krishna bhakti means going to the temple yes these are activities which are important as parts of bhakti but the essence of bhakti is a relationship with krishna and relationship means that it has many different aspects so say a mother may love her child and when she loves her child uh, that love naturally she would want to be always with her with the baby or with the child but then say if the mother has to go for a job or the child has to go to school then the mother has to let the child go the mother has to let herself go so then what is happening is uh, maybe the mother could say that i could remember my child much better when i see my child and remember or much better when uh, i am when we are in front of each other but when we go away can't remember that much and at a in a, at a practical level yes if the mother is at her job she uh, then she's busy in that but why is she going there so that she can earn some money and take care of her family take care of her child so bhakti is a relationship and in the relationship uh, we grow by taking responsibility doing what is required for the other person and while we are taking responsibility it's not necessary that we are constantly consciously remembering that other person so the mother is doing her job and she is really caught in doing that job is she remembering her baby maybe not necessarily but she is doing it for her family for her baby For, so similarly when a devotee is doing a service to krishna when arjuna is fighting a war now is arjuna remembering chanting the holy names maybe maybe not we don't know at least the mahabharata doesn't describe that but even if he were not chanting why is he fighting that war for krishna for his service to krishna so remembrance of krishna when the when it is talked about in the scriptures so in my understanding remembrance is not so much of a specific act activity as a specific orient a uh, direction of the heart so it's not so much about a factual recollection 
it is more about a redirection of the heart and that happens when we are in a relationship with krishna and we are taking responsibility in that relationship so taking responsibility in that relationship means that we do what is necessary <coughs> so if we it is said about uh, rupa and sanatan goswami that dhira dhira jana priyo that they were dear to the saintly and the sober people and even the not sober people so it is said about sanatan goswami he was like the guru for everyone in vrindavan and when he would meet people he would ask the family members rajwasis about their family life and he would be himself absorbed in krishna but he would ask questions like that and they loved him so we we need to connect with we need to do our job at a professional level we need to connect with the people at people at a human level and we are connecting with krishna sorry we are connecting with them we may not be consciously remembering krishna but because our life is oriented towards serving krishna and it may be let's put it this way that suppose consider this from krishna's perspective let's say i meet a new person and i am so caught in remembering krishna that i don't reciprocate properly with that person and then that person thinks you know krishna's devotees are so impolite and so self absorbed i don't want to i don't want to know more about them i don't want to be like, i'd be like them i just want to forget everything forget this krishna bhakti business on the other hand say if i am interacting with someone and i try to be courteous warm uh, basically be develop a human connection with the prabhupad said my followers and ladies and gentlemen so then then at the end of it that person thinks that oh okay yeah this krishna devotees seem to be nice people i want to know more about them i want to connect with them i want maybe i want to become like them so from krishna's perspective which is more important krishna would want a soul who is lost to come closer to him and then that way the krishna will be more pleased so i might be absorbing krishna i might think i am absorbing krishna but i might be in the name of being absorbed in krishna might be alienating myself from krishna because i am not doing what i am meant to do as a service recently i heard about uh, jayanan prabhu he was on a he had to go from one place to another and he was in a truck he some he got a pick a lift in a truck and the truck driver was a typical american truck driver so then he said do you you want to hear some music and then this was the same music kind of music that uh, yandra would hear and play before he came to bhakti and he could say this is my i don't want to hear it but he said it is like whatever it is an hour or so kind of drive so he said that at least this is the narrative of that person who later became a devotee says he just sang those songs with me and he sang those songs so enthusiastically he said at the end of it he is such a nice person i want to know what this person does i i want to become like that person i'm not, i'm not recommending song singing movie songs with people that's not the point over here the point is that um, <clears throat> we need to like i said stay connected with krishna we also need to stay connected with people especially if people are we are already in a relationship with them or we want to help them on their spiritual journey so rather than focusing so much on the on the specific whether i am remembering krishna or not you can focus more on the principle that am i doing what is required for a service to krishna so in some ways the remembrance will come gradually it will increase more and more as our relationship with krishna increases more and more sometimes we may not even remember say first time if you give a class we might be speaking about krishna but we may not be remembering krishna because we are so caught okay i am giving a talk how are people observing me but as we become more and more familiarized with that service then what happens the specifics of that service we are aware of them but they go into the background and the purpose of the service comes more and more in the foreground so remembrance of krishna may increase even while we are absorbed in the service and that can happen over a period of time but we focus more on the principle of service 
then on some preconceived idea of what remembrance means. Okay. Thank you, and and just to I um, really just for myself, I really love that. So ultimately, it's not, <laughs> for example, a, a literal, uh, I guess definition of when I'm going to the bathroom thinking of Krishna, I pick up this pen, I'm thinking of Krishna. It really is this overall kind of direction, orientation. I am dedicated to Krishna. I'm dedicated to Bhakti. That is my life. And uh, it's helpful to as um, for example say grahastas or those sort of jobs. It's do your duty wholeheartedly because you know that is in service of Krishna and of course offering all fruits to him but um, so it's not a literal in one sense um, definition but really as you said the overall kind of orientation the overall mood the overall goal is at the end of the day uh, you know serving Krishna having that relationship with Krishna and as we absorb ourselves in that relationship more naturally remember him more will come as well is that correct yes definitely I wouldn't say it is not literal. Literal is definitely there, but it is also more than literal. So we definitely want to come to a stage where we can literally remember Krishna also. That you know, so we behold Krishna, we hear about Krishna's pastimes, and we are directly remembering Krishna. So it's literal, but it's also more than literal. Not not literal. So not not literal. It's it is more than literal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Gail with us. Uh, would you like to ask any question, Gail? Okay, we are not yet fortunate enough to hear the Super Soul's voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we stop here, Gorgomar? Or you have any other concluding questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, if there is time, I can just ask one last question just yes, to summarize yes. the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so I've also heard in some of your classes, Prabhu, that it's not about feeling good or about feeling bad, but it's about going beyond feeling good and bad. It's going beyond the feeling good and bad and focusing on what uh, moving closer to Krishna, right? So that should be our goal. It's not about feeling good or feeling bad. So one example I was thinking from the Bhagavatam. Uh, which depicts this nicely is Vritrasura. So he had so many reasons to feel bad. For example, uh, even the demons on his side abandoned him at one point. Mm -hmm. um, demigods wanted to um, kill him. And even the Lord actually was involved in giving the thunderbolt to Indra to actually kill him. Uh... He had so many reasons to feel bad. And he had certain reasons to feel good also in the sense that when there were times in the battle with Indra where he threw the club and uh, Airavata got uh, injured. So, but he did not feel good. He did not feel bad. He was just praying in a prayerful mood. He went beyond the stage of feeling good and feeling bad. Um, so my question is, will prayer actually take us to the point about, or will it take us to transcending this mode of feeling good and feeling bad. Yes. Will praying take us beyond feeling good and feeling bad? Yes, praying is one of the limbs of bhakti. And if we practice bhakti diligently, that does raises us above the feelings that come from the, from the circumstances and the conditionings of the mind. So if we consider Krishna talks about Matra Sparshas to Kaunteya, Shitosha Sukha Dukha Daha, Agam Apaino Nityas Tam Sitiksha Swabharata. So this is, we could say, more of a prescriptive verse. They tolerate. And uh, he's talking about uh, the environment is heat and cold. Then with respect to uh, the body or the mind, we can say pleasure and pain. So he's talking about both of these things. Hmm. So now, if you consider a little later in the sixth chapter, Krishna says in six seven that Jitatmanaha Prashantasya Paramatma Samahitaha Shitoshna Sukha Dukkeshu Tathamana Apamanayo. So here Krishna is describing that Paramatma Samahitaha. If one has connected with the super soul, then what will happen? Automatically, we will we'll go beyond the duality. Shitoshna Sukha Dukkeshu Tathamana Apamanayo. 
Here Krishna also talks about the same two dualities, heat and cold and pleasure and pain. And he adds one more duality, honor and dishonor. But the principle is the same thing of dualities. So one way is that with Atma Gyan, with knowledge of the soul, one learns to consciously tolerate the dualities and persevere. And that is 240. And 67 is talking about, uh, about how connection with the super soul will take us beyond the dualities. So it could be more of a intellectual contemplation or it could be a spiritual or a devotional connection. So both ways with intellectual contemplation it will require a conscious effort. With a devotional connection, it may come as a more natural byproduct. But either way, yes, if we, we, need, we need to ensure that the dualities don't distract us from staying on the spiritual path. So if we feel Prabhupada writes about this in I think 256 purport, where he says that Dukkeshu Anudignamana Sukeshu Vigata Spruha. There he says if the devotee gets distressed, a devotee connects the distress with Krishna by thinking that. Actually, I deserve more distress, but Krishna has minimized this. And if a devotee gets, uh, gets a comfortable situation, gets pleasure, you only think that oh, Krishna has given me this comfortable situation so that I can serve him more. So in that sense, it's not that we deny the experience of duality, but we try to oh, connect that experience with Krishna. It's, we can't say, I, I'm, if I'm feeling bad, I can't say that. I can't artificially say I'm feeling good. I can't even say artificially say that I'm not feeling bad. But what I can say is yes, this is how I'm feeling, but this is connected with Krishna. So thank you very much. And I think the connection was a little poor today. Sorry about that. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This was really thank wonderful. You thank you, Rathina. Thank, thank, thank you, you Tiffany. Yourself. Thank you, Gorkumar Prabhu, for coordinating everything. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you next time. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs>